What is a conspiracy theory you believe 100%? Pablo Escobar worked with the CIA. They were involved in the illegal substances trade. This is confirmed by his son. The reasons for working together was the fight against communism in Central America. They were working together in sales and importing snow to the states. The CIA's role was exposed in 1996 in an investigative series, Dark Alliance, by Gary Webb for the San Jose Mercury News. The investigation, headed up by Webb, revealed ties between the CIA, Nicaragua Contras, and the substances ravaging African-American communities. This investigation severely damaged the intelligence agency's reputation and launched a number of federal investigations. Things didn't end well for Webb. Major media led by the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times worked to discredit his story and he lost his work and died in 2004 for ending himself. Officials would later come forward to back Webb's original investigation up. Senator John Kerry even released a detailed report claiming not only was there considerable evidence linking the Contra effort to trafficking of substances and weapons, but that the U.S. government knew about it. Story 2. The Mattress Mafia How often do you have to buy mattresses? Maybe every five to seven years? But how come there are so many mattress stores? Sit and Sleep, Mattress Firm, Banner Mattress, and so many more of these stores compete with each other. That's fair enough, but how can they have so many stores and stay in business? San Marcos, within 10 miles of each other, there are 12 mattress-only stores. That's not including stores that also sell furniture. Still don't believe me? Well, you should. Even Mattress Firm's top two executives and chairman resigned after postponing their financial accounts in 2017 due to some accounting failures. Well, now that you're obviously on my side, otherwise you're just supporting literal crime, now I can share with you who is running the Mattress Mafia. The Mafia. They're still very much an active organization. They started up and ran Las Vegas and still do today, so they have to launder their money somewhere. As a legitimate business, they knew that they had to diversify their money laundering lest they get found out. So they looked at mattresses. People buy them, people need them, so why not? But they slipped up and I, among others, am onto them. Each store would need to bring in a considerable amount of money to stay in business. According to a source, mattress firm's 4K to 6K square footage at $430 to $650 brings the lowball amount to $1.72 million per store. No rent involved. Add in the rent, which the lease says will increase every five years, and this can reach $3 million. Put this to how much a mattress costs, and you see that to break even, they would have to sell roughly 2,660 mattresses per store. Put this against how many mattress firms alone there are in the United States. According to Mattress Firm themselves, they own 3,500 stores. That equals 9,308,000 mattresses needed to be sold to pay off their stores. That doesn't include rent, employees, or the fact that this would require them to have a consistent flow of sales, or the mafia could lend a helping hand. All I'm saying is that none of this adds up to a successful business. Mattress Firm, the most successful one, in addition to dozens of companies like them, they're all money launderers. How often do you buy a new car? Once every 10 years? And not everyone needs a car. Everyone needs a mattress. Damn, did this guy just crack the code? Story 3. That the complete lack of proper political discussion nowadays and extreme polarization is done on purpose to keep the people fighting each other instead of actually moving forward and realizing that we're losing more freedom every day that passes. Put another way, Noam Chomsky put forward the idea of manufactured consent or propaganda theory. The idea is that you have a very narrow scope of allowable political positions, but encourage vigorous debate with that narrow scope. This way, everyone gets an opinion that they can shout from the hilltops, but regardless of who wins the debate, very little changes. You can see it plain as day in the media, not in what they say, but what they don't say. A recent example that comes to mind is the debate about policy to curtail school shootings. There's so much psychology and sociology to unpack in what inspires these events. Yet somehow, the AR-15 specifically became a topic of debate. I get that's the gun that Cruz used, but he literally could have used just about anything. That's not even a consistent threat in other school incidents. But you can debate about this scary-looking military-style gun, even propose to ban it, and essentially nothing changes. The same goes for the mental health line. It's just scapegoating. The uncomfortable conversations about American culture don't have to happen because you have a symbol that you can divide people on. Pro-AR-15 or anti-AR-15. Pro-gun, anti-gun. Pro-choice, pro-life, Democrat, Republican, etc., etc. Narrow scope of ideas debated vigorously. These, ultimately cosmetic binaries, are the basis by which the majority of the populace can tend to be governed by this current system. It convinces people they have a say in their governance. Oh, another example. Facebook. We're all mad at Facebook for selling our data and maybe even Twitter et al. will be dragged into it. All these debates about privacy and Congress thinking about regulating social media, but I haven't seen much conversation in the mainstream media regarding the NSA spying that's been known about for the better part of a decade. It's not cool when Facebook sells our data to whoever, but warrantless spying on all our communications is acceptable because terrorists? 
In short, Americans, by and large, have brutally and nuanced politics. To an extent, we're proud of it, and I don't think it's an accident. The lack of nuance and raging debate between two false dichotomies keeps the power structure more or less stable. Story 4. What the authorities say. Mick Jagger is simply an iconic rock and roll star and nothing more. Theory from you slash Ramsey's The Pigeon. The song TikTok, as performed by Kesha, was written by a guy named Benny Blanco. Its lyrics include the line, We kick them to the curb unless they look like Mick Jagger. That's a little bit strange, right? Mick Jagger wasn't exactly at the height of his attractiveness when the piece in question came out. Stranger still, it wasn't the only popular song to paint the man in a pleasant light. Moves Like Jagger, performed by Maroon 5, was released at around the same time, and Benny Blanco also had a hand in writing that one. This is where things start to get creepy. The song, The Time, Dirty Bit, as performed by the Black Eyed Peas, features the following phrase. All these girls, they like my swagger, they call me Mick Jagger, I'd be rolling like a stone. It was written by John Day Nicola, who used to produce the music for a band called Kara's Flowers, although you might know them better by their current name of Maroon 5. The song Heart and Soul, as performed by the Jonas Brothers, contains a verse that ends with making mistakes, but that won't matter if you can swag like old Mick Jagger. Antonina Armato wrote the piece, and she's managed by Downtown Music Publishing. Care to guess who else they manage? Here's a hint. It rhymes with Balloon Hive. This web of connections extends all throughout the recording industry, but one thing remains unclear. What's the link back to Mick Jagger himself? There must be something. Because if you have a look at Google Trends, you'll see that his popularity spiked with the release of each song. The only time in recent memory when it has been higher is during a period in March of 2014, when his girlfriend died. Some people have suggested that the man's name is just as easy to rhyme with swagger. But popular usage of the word, in reference to something other than a walking gait, came about after the aforementioned songs that hit the airwaves. In other words, Jagger prompted swagger, not the other way around. Why does there seem to be a cabal of artists trying to artificially inflate the performer's appeal and popularity? What benefit is there in promoting an aging rock star? Who is actually behind this odd trend? In order to answer those questions, we need to turn to Vivendi. This is a company which owns a lot of stuff. Their subsidiaries include Daily Motion, Ubisoft, Gameloft, and the Universal Music Group. The Rolling Stones signed to Universal Music in 2008. In 2010, all of the songs listed above were released. Look at those Google Trends again. 2008 marked Mick Jagger's lowest ever dip in popularity, and the slump continued until February of 2010, right after TikTok became the most popular song on the radio. In September of that same year, the Rolling Stones re-released their rare concert movie, securing the number one spot in four different countries' charts, the US and the UK being two of them, second place and four more in a double platinum certification in Canada. Strangely enough, though, the only other place besides the United States where platinum status was achieved was in France, which is where Vivendi's located. What if all this was carefully planned and executed? What if there's a shadowy organization that's intent on promoting Mick Jagger for their own profit? What if I made all of this up on a whim and just found whatever tenuous evidence I could to support it? <laughs> this is great. I imagine your office is full of red string connecting pictures and news articles of all the aforementioned people tacked onto the wall. Story 5 Yuesugi Kenshin, a Japanese daimyo, warlord, and one of the most powerful and cunning generals of his time, so much so that he was considered an avatar of the god of war, was actually a woman. Let's look at some evidence that supports this. Number one, Kenshin had severe stomach cramps on a monthly basis, around the 10th of the month. He actually scheduled his military campaigns around this. Number two, Kenshin's cause of death is recorded as a form of uterine cancer, by a doctor who made virtually no mistakes in the rest of the book that it's written in. 3. When the Uesugi were forced to relocate, they repeatedly took Kenshin's remains with them, and refused to tell even the shogun where he was interred. This rules out DNA testing. 4. Kenshin's personal tastes and appearance were consistently described in feminine terms, which, given the extreme subtleties of Japanese, is actually a bigger deal than it might seem. 5. Kenshin was the only man allowed by the shogun to wander among his harem. 6. Kenshin never married and never had children, although he did adopt. 7. He was described as beautiful with a very pale face and small features. Now the source of this theory is a pretty crazy historian. Forgot his name. But I believe it and it's pretty interesting to think about. It's a good thing people were blocked from doing DNA testing back then. Now it's a free for all. Enjoying these conspiracy theories? How about hitting the like button and subscribing to my channel? No theories here, just facts. Like the fact that this is the best YouTube channel. <sighs> anyway. Story 6. Facebook is collecting microphone data to advertise to us. It's a theory I've seen people mention several times and I always just brushed it off. I work in the tech industry and I've learned most people aren't even all that aware of what they're doing on their own computers. I always assumed the suspicious advertising was coming from search history or cookies embedded in people's devices. 
I was over at a friend's house and it mentioned my throat was sore and I might be coming down with something. She had just been given a large box of emergency vitamin juice powder packets. We had a lengthy conversation about the packets and how she got them. But until that moment, it was a product I had never seen or heard of before. My phone was definitely on and in my hands during the conversation. I was sending information of where to meet up with someone for the next day. That conversation was over messenger. I definitely didn't do any additional research into the emergency packets. By the time I got home that night and for roughly three days afterwards, emergency packets were heavily advertised to me over Facebook. I haven't really seen them since, but they were certainly prevalent for a short period of time immediately after the verbal conversation. I tried this and damn it's true. There was a time I did an experiment about dog treats. We talked about it for a good 10 minutes with my buddies. After a few hours, all dog treats on my feed. I actually creeped me out a bit. Story 7 The promoter of the local Comic Con is trying to get rid of the loyal guests or cosplayers by selling fewer and fewer three-day passes. This con is held three times a year, in April, August, and December. It's the weekend, in fact. They max out the building fire code capacity every time, but the promoter has a great deal with a convention center, including exclusive rights to Comic Con held there, so he won't move it to the big center downtown, because they can't get any more people in the door. He's been trying to make more money by screwing with the tickets and with the vendors. First, he eliminated the second badge from vendor table purchases. If you have a helper, they have to buy a second vendor pass. It costs more than a three-day guest pass, so a lot of vendors buy their assistants the three-day. Although they can't get in trouble for that and the helper can't go to set up on Thursday. Next, he did away with reduced price passes for the big groups like the 501st, which is the largest Star Wars club in the world, and used to volunteer to help run the con. The left effort he tried to get them to sign an agreement that they wouldn't go to any other cons, which, as a 501c3 charity, they aren't allowed to do. Now I think he's trying to maximize ticket sales by cutting three-day passes. They sell out earlier every con, so only single-day passes are available. Instead of a $38 three-day, you have to buy three $19 one-day passes, or not go all three days. What he wants is for people to buy a one-day pass, come in for three hours, spend their money, then leave. He doesn't make as much money office bums that go for the whole weekend. And since I was thrown out in December, I won't be giving him any money this time. I don't have any real proof this is what's happening, but it seems very likely. And he kind of showed his hand while kicking me out. Story 8 That potato crisp bags aren't 60% air to protect them during shipping. The manufacturers are lowering the quantity of the product so they can still compete on price. Not just with crisps. Sorry, British, can't bring myself to call them chips, but with all packaged foods. I used to be a news agent. You would sometimes see the effect of a batch of stock coming in where you would have to wait until the shelf was completely empty before restocking or it is blatantly obvious that there are different sizes. Companies tend to mask it by having an interim offer where it is, say, 10% extra free for a couple of months. And when the offer is over, the new stock is 5% smaller than it was before. It is only really noticeable in slower moving lines where you didn't receive the interim offer stock. Since Brexit in the UK and the loss of value of sterling directly afterwards, almost all confectionery products have reduced in size to keep the price around the same point. For example, a standard bottle of milkshake like Yazoo used to be 500 ml, now it tends to be 400 or 420 ml. In general, most of the packaged foods we're buying are now providing around 20% less product than two years ago for the same price. Damn it, corporations. Now we gotta make sure I get the correct amount of cinnamon toast crunch each time I buy. Story 9. That the tobacco industry has driven the vape bans, aka flavor bans, across the country by promising more money to states. There's the misconception that big vape is the same as big tobacco, and a lot of that has to do with Juul, who is owned by Altria. Juul didn't even start out as Altria, but they eventually bought it. When Juul wasn't owned by Altria, they had more tame ads, and while they were the choice of teens, they weren't explicitly targeted. Once Altria bought Juul, some funky stuff went down. Juul ads began having more colorful and cartoonish ads, or what most people would classify as ads appealing to children. Every tobacco company has to do anti-smoking initiatives by law, and when Altria bought Juul, there were reports of reps doing those anti-smoking talks to teens then advertising Juul when teachers looked away. The truth is owned by the tobacco companies. Anyone notice a difference between their old smoking ads and current vaping ads? Their old smoking ads were obnoxious AF, which is actually a tactic they've used for a while. By making their anti-smoking PSA obnoxious, fewer people would take them serious, causing less of a dent in their cigarette sales. Notice how most of the truth's anti-vape ads aren't obnoxious? Best part is, long after Altria bought Juul, Juul was in a California court, and their attorney literally said, Your Honor, can't you see that this is all a tactic by Big Tobacco to stop vaping to get their customers back? Juul is Big Tobacco. I can't help but feel they did that to make those of us seeing the shit sound crazy. In reality, many adult vapors actually use, or used, since many states have made it so only pods are sellable, refillable tanks instead of pods. Most vapes you find in gas stations and pods found around are owned by tobacco companies, and there's a massive quality difference. 
Using a gas station vape or a pod feels no different to me than smoking, and I got respiratory infections like I did when smoking with them. On the other hand, most refillable liquids were made by small businesses, and many of those have zero interaction with tobacco. A lot of those get their nicotine from tomatoes and tea, not tobacco, so big tobacco saw zero from small vape businesses. There's also a huge quality difference. In that I can feel my lungs healing from my years of smoking with a small business, refillable e-juice, while the tobacco-owned pods make me feel like I'm reopening smoke wounds. The thing about the flavor ban is, a lot of us actually don't really care about flavors. Like, yeah, my coffee or cheesecake is a nice bonus, but what I care more about is being able to breathe. Only the refillables do that for me. However, if there's no flavors, how can a business stay around? I mean, all they'd sell is tobacco flavor, and that's not enough to keep a small business open. That's what's so ironic about the flavor bans. Everyone says it's to hurt big tobacco, but in reality, it's just giving them a monopoly again. Only big tobacco can afford to only sell tobacco-flavored products. The small businesses we should be helping fight big tobacco have been closing down because they can't compete with big tobacco anymore, thanks to these laws. Then, a lot of areas that ban flavors are seeing teens smoke traditional cigarettes again. Real smoking amongst teens was non-existent. Many people point to the teen smoking rate going up around 2017. Well, the reason it appears to have gone up is because their smoking and vaping statistics were rolled into one. In reality, the same amount of teens have used nicotine products for a while now. They just stopped smoking. But now that vaping is going away, because a flavor ban does effectively ban vaping, they're smoking again. It astounds me that the UK is pushing vape as a harm reduction alternative to smoking based on their own government-funded studies. Yet, our US FDA and CDC are trusting tobacco-funded studies that say vaping is equal or more harmful than smoking. Then what do the states get from this? More money. Vaping hadn't fallen under the traditional tobacco taxes, and they didn't give money for the Master Settlement Agreement, or MSA. What the MSA did was give states a certain amount of money for each pack of cigarettes sold. 50 cents per pack was the highest some states got, and if you look at the timelines, the states that got that much were the first to enact flavor bans, while states that got less dragged their feet. Which, this all sucks, because I try to tell anyone anything positive about vape flavors. They think all I care about is a quick buzz. No, what I care about is having a safer alternative to improve my health. Smoking did a number on me, but I've actually gotten healthier after starting vaping. And thanks to refillable tanks, I've been able to titrate my nicotine to know where I've got 0.5 milligrams of nicotine per ml, and we'll be able to stop altogether in a month. That's not something you can do with traditional cigarettes or pods. Then people will tell me propaganda that is easily verifiable false from evidence-based studies or my own experience. I mean, I've actually told doctor that with the flavor bans, if all I can get are pods, a part of me feels like smoking again since it won't make a difference. And it's hilarious to see them go from vaping is worse than smoking to wait, no, smoking is so much worse, you shouldn't switch back. Most of all, what I don't understand is smoking and vaping is 21 in the US now, like alcohol. Why does alcohol get to have flavors, but when vapes do, it's considered too appealing to kids? How is flavored alcohol also not appealing to kids? If 21 is good enough to allow alcohol flavors, why isn't it for vaping? The fight against flavor bans isn't about some fleeting pleasure, it's about being able to make more choices with our health. But then it takes away money from states and big tobacco. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy. What are some very creepy facts? You wouldn't believe Story 3 is real. See you in that video.